Hello my friends, I am in Pamplona, the capital of the autonomous community of Navarra, from where we will initiate our wine journey through the denomination of origin Navarra. You may have heard about the main holiday celebration in Pamplona, the San Fermines, that start with a big explosion, the petardazo, and run for a whole week in July with people running with bulls through the streets of the city. Ernest Hemingway was in love with this city. Navarra has been known in the past for its rosé wines, but things have changed in the recent decades, and now excellent and sophisticated red and white wines are also being elaborated here. I invite you to accompany us on a journey to visit the houses of passionate winemakers that will reveal us the secrets of viticulture and winemaking in Navarra. Navarra is a Spanish denomination of origin for wines from the southern half of the autonomous community of Navarra. The vineyards are on the lower slopes of the Pyrenees as they descend towards the basin of the river Ebro. The Dio is organized around five subzones. Valdizarbe, the northernmost subzone covering 25 municipalities on the upper reaches of the Arga River, is a strategic location of the Way of St. James as several paths crossing Navarra converge here. Tierra Estella, to the west of Valdizarbe, covers 38 municipalities and stands along the Way of St. James in the western Navarra, on the middle of the reaches of the Ega River. The Ribera Alta subzone is centered on the town of Olite, on the left bank of the river Ebro, above the lower reaches of the rivers Arca, Ega and Aragon, and covers 26 municipalities. Baja Montaña covers 22 municipalities and is located in the northeast of the Dio, on the middle reaches of the river Aragon. And finally, the Ribera Baja Subzón, in the south of Navarra, covers 14 different municipalities, all on a dry, sandy plain on the right bank of the river Ebro. of winery equipment and installations from the Romans have been found in several archaeological excavations in Navarra, illustrating the long history of winemaking in the region. Viticulture prospered in the Middle Ages, when Navarra was a powerful independent kingdom with close ties to France, in good part due to the consumption of wine by the pilgrims on the way of St. James. Towards the end of the 18th century, viticulture was the main agricultural activity of the area. As in most parts of Europe, the phylloxera devastated the vineyards towards the end of the 19th century, destroying most grape plantings in the region. Winemaking was recovered by wine cooperatives in the early stages of the 20th century, but concentrating the production of large quantities of book wine for sport markets. Also, the status of the denomination of origin were approved in 1933, they have been more recently updated 
to reflect the change in the wine production philosophy during the last four decades, when winemakers have focused on the elaboration of wines of different styles and high quality. I'm here in San Martín de Unx in Navarra, in the Navarra DO, and I'm with Gonzalo Celayeta, who is actually the technical director of the cooperative San Martín, the technical director of Bodegas uh, Unsi, and the owner of his own winery that is called uh, Gonzalo Celayeta after his name. Hi Gonzalo, pleased to meet you. Thanks for having us. How are you? Very well, my pleasure. Well, before talking about your wines and your projects, I'd like you to explain the formation of the cooperative. The cooperative was founded in 1914. I'm not wrong. Cooperatives had, in this area and through Spain, much importance in the development of winemaking at that time for many reasons, right? Yes, indeed, cooperatives started in this area. This movement started in Navarra. This is the second oldest cooperative in Navarra and possibly at the national wine level. It was born with the help of the regional bank. Back then the idea was that the small producers, then the farmers, were very small and they had no access to the market. They could not secure decent prices for the grapes. And then, well, there were large merchants at that time who took advantage of the wine growers a bit. And there the Caja Rural was born and intervened with a focused social goal, creating the first cooperatives, uniting wine growers that formed their own cellars and somehow joined forces to be able to sell those products. Not just nationally, but also embarking in old export adventures with the idea of being able to have decent prices. It coincides with all the disasters that happened around the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries with phylloxera, with the depopulation of rural areas. And that's what kept the viticulturists alive, right? Yes, well, the phylloxera was somewhat earlier. It caused the devastation of the vineyards, which had to be regenerated. It was when the vineyards were recovered, when the problems of sale or unification started, until today. This is a new building, but you have the old one still more or less standing. It is not longer used, but it, there is where you have the concrete deposit so characteristic of the cooperatives. How many members do you have now? Now we are approximately 93 members, bringing the grapes here to this winery since 1914. Nearly 110 years of uninterrupted history, it has never closed. The new building was built between 1999 and 2000. The old facilities became obsolete, especially for work comfort. How many wines in total come out of here? How many labels? Because they are not only the wines of the cooperative, but also some winemakers who made the wines here. Like in your case, for example, how many different labels you have? There could be around Adding the own labels of the cooperative, we may have 15 or 20 different wine labels. You say that you have around 90 wine growers now, more or less. How many were they at the first? Uh, has it risen or has it fallen? It has decreased. Generally, in the past, the usual thing was very small plots. Well, I believe that in all styles of agriculture, there were very small farms and a lot of small wine growers. And nowadays, people tend to have bigger farms. And those with a little bigger areas have other people working on their state. But it is not as diversified as it was before. In recent years, we are making a lot of effort through many initiatives started here to recover young people in the agricultural sector especially with the idea that there is not so much rural deep population. And what is happening is that all the vineyards that are in the mountains are being paid almost twice as much as the rest of the grapes, with the idea that with small plots from people who are new, who join the sector for the first time, don't need much extension and don't need a very strong initial investment. 
Navarra is known for its garnacha roses. Garnacha was what covered 90% of the plantings 100 years ago. This has changed. Lots of Tempranillo, Cabernet, Merlot have been introduced. Not really in our case, as in San Martín de Uñz, in this location, the nucleus of what is the Baja Montaña of the Navarra denomination of origin, which is the low mountain area, as it has traditionally been the nerve centre of Rosé and Garnacha, and to this day it continues to be so. In fact, almost 65% of the surface is still Garnacha. I am in the Castillo, in the subzone Tierra Estella of the denomination of origin Navarra, to introduce the section covering the climate, the geology and the soils of this region and how they relate to the viticultural practices in the region. The climate in Navarra is continental. This means long, hot, dry summers and cold winters with particularly low temperatures in some areas. The northern south zones benefit from influences from the Atlantic Ocean to the north, with mod moderate heat during the period when the grapes are ripening, as the nights start to get cooler during the month of August. Indeed, the DO has influences from the Mediterranean as well. The confluency of the continental, Atlantic and Mediterranean climates provides a diversity of climatologic conditions to the DO. Average rainfall in the DO is 600 mm per year, but oscillates from 400 to 1,000. In the areas of higher altitudes, there is occasional risk of frost and violent storms. Let's ask the viticulturists about this and what it means for the grape growing. I'm here in Tirapu, Navarra, and I'm with Luis Moya, who is the owner of Bodegas LMT Wines. Hi Luis, thanks for being with us and receiving us. My pleasure. We are in the northernmost area of what is the Dio Navarra. Right there, behind the Peldon mountain, we have the region of Pamplona, from where we receive more Atlantic influence. But this is a climate with a continental base. We are away from large bodies of water. And yes, it is true that the Mediterranean climate is a bit far away, but hey, some years we can also have a Mediterranean influence. It is basically a continental climate with Atlantic or Mediterranean influence, depending on the year. It's a warm climate, very hot in the summer. What level of precipitation? Well, we can go from 1,000 litres to 600 or 500. All right, I'm here in the Castillo, that is uh, in the Navarra de O, and I'm with Carlos Arondo, who is the winemaker for uh, Bodegas Emilio Valerio. Thank you, Carlos, for having us. How are you? Thank you very much. We are in a zone that cannot be said that it is clearly Mediterranean or Atlantic. We are at the crossroads between both. This area is pretty warm. And the winter? It's cold, but without the extreme temperatures of the inner land. We are in between climates. The height also influences a lot because we are also in a transition zone between the mountain and the plain and we have vineyards that are from 300 meters of altitude to 700. So it also depends on what vineyard we talk about. It also changes a lot. And then as for rains, well, it's not a very humid area, really. There will be about 400 liters, more or less. Very different, for example, from the Pamplona area that practically doubles us despite being so close. But there is quite a difference. We live here in Murchante, in Navarra, in the Rivera Baja, and I'm with uh, Tomás Santos, who is the owner of uh, Bodegas Finca La Cantera. Uh, Thank you very much for having us. How are you? Very well. I want you to explain to me the climate you have here, because it's probably quite different to the rest of Navarra, especially further north. Yes, well here, what marks us is the sunlight there are many sunny days. It is a very dry climate, bordering on desert-like, because we are very close to the Baldena Reale, which is desert. We are also very marked by the wind, which is called El Cierto. 
It blows throughout the Ebro Valley and dries the environment. There is practically no humidity during the year. It can rain 300 litres, 350 litres per year. For example, in the north of Navarra, you can get 800 to 1800 litres. That makes us unique. For cultivation, it allows us to make very few treatments to the vineyard because it practically doesn't rain and we have the fiefo that dries up, making it difficult for fungi to grow. We say that we are soil, Moncayo and Fiefo. It's kind of our winery motto. Moncayo, the mountain over there. It is the mountain in the background, which is 2,300 meters high. It prevents the cold from the Atlantic from passing. In fact, you can see how the clouds get stuck to it, to the mountain, right? vary across the different subzones, with clay and loam dominating in Tierra Estella and Ribera Alta, a more rocky composition found in Baja Montaña, alluvial soils in Aldizarbe as well and loam limestone and sand in Ribera Baja. However, a complex mixture of loam, clay, sand, mold and stone is found almost everywhere across the DO. Let's check these soils in the terrain. we are on a terrain that is absolutely original, fantastic and unique. We are in the area of El Yesao here in Tirapu, in the subzone Valdizarbe inside the Navarre Dio, and it's a chalk deposit. What we have here is a large chalk deposit with little soil but with a lot of limestone, stones, small pieces of calcareous chalk. In the past, they came to collect materials to make lime for construction houses. This is good. It is a very special soil that gives special character to the wine. Gonzalo, we are in Baja Montaña. We're not in a vineyard. We are on top of a little hill from where we can see a fantastic perspective of the vineyards and how they grow here surrounded by wild forests. Explain it to me a bit. You have some vineyards over there, don't you? Yes. From here, you can appreciate very well that the concept is the idea we have of ourselves, of the cultivation of the vineyard. We always look for plots surrounded by wild forest. San Martín de Ungs makes a shape of a horseshoe formed by the Guerin and Ujue mountain ranges. Here behind would be the Pyrenees. This would be the door to the Pyrenees, the beginning of the Baja Montaña, which is in San Martín de Ungs. And what makes up the town is a horseshoe of a series of reefs and terraces, which is where the vineyards are located. We always look for vineyards that are surrounded by wild forest, because that allows us on the one hand to be much more sustainable, not having other crops around, and above all, due to the influence that the environment and all the surrounding vegetation that in the end here is Mediterranean forest, with diverse species of bushes and plants that greatly influence the result of the wines, with those notes of thyme and other aromatic plants. It helps you maintain biodiversity because you don't have monocultures around. That is it. By being surrounded by vegetation, we also have more fauna and less need for phytosanitary treatments. This helps us to be sustainable, above all, because we have to intervene much less because of the fauna that we have around. Baja Montaña, of the five sons of the Navarra denominations of origin, it is the one that, as you have explained before, as you get closer to the Pyrenees, you gain altitude, but the vineyards are characterized because they are on slopes, in terraces, in the slopes. You can see over there Olite and all the valley, the plain, and here on the other side, 
the mountain. Yes, in fact, only in San Martín de Ongs, from the beginning of the town to the top, there is a differential of 500 meters of altitude. It is here, in San Martín de Ongs, where the Ribera Alta ends and the Baja Montaña begins. So what we have is altitude, and then a lot more Pyrenean influence, because it is close and to the mountains. There is much more rain and, above all, more humidity than in the Ribera Alta area. And then that altitude gives us a lower temperature gradient. There is also more contrast between day and night. This translates a more maturation of the grape and Baja Montaña also has the particularity that it is in the area where the garnacha has been most preserved. This is the zone, let's say, most characteristic for the production of rosé wines. The garnacha has always been the queen variety for the production of rosé wines. Here, both in San Martín and the rest of the Baja Montaña towns, we have dedicated lots of effort to the cultivation of the garnacha and to defend and the rosé wines. We have stony ground, but it drains the rain very well. But then we have a slab in the background that makes it hold. What is it? Well, they're clays, they're mixtures. But well, you see, this is a dry land. Here we could irrigate, but we don't do it and it dries up. But the vineyards always maintain the leaves very well. I am in Olite, a central wine town of the subzone of Ribera Alta, to talk about the culture and grapes of the denomination of origin Navarra. Most vines are trained along trellises, called espalderas in Spain, to maximize exposure to sunlight and to facilitate mechanization. However, centenary old vineyards with low vanch vines are being recovered by a number of modern viticulturists to bring to a new life the extraordinary qualities that Garnacha grown in this region has to offer. Different viticultural approaches are followed by modern viticulturists searching for wines of the highest quality. Let's hear from them directly. This particular vineyard is very special because these are centenary old bunch vines. This is your specialty. Seek to recover this type of ancient vineyards, particularly of Garnacha. Yes, well, my project has four legs, a little differentiated. And yes, the base is clearly always the Garnacha. The goal is to recover vineyards that might otherwise disappear. This is a centenary vineyard. Basically, what we do is an ancestral viticulture, manual viticulture. This is a non-mechanized vineyard. This is the only one that is worked with a horse. The others we have, we do not plow. We just clean the wild vegetation around the vines. We work a lot with organic matter, eliminating herbicides. We try to work with a base of principles of regenerative agriculture. That is, we need to have a balance. Let there be life, let us have herbs. It helps us have more microorganisms that are able to exercise control over mildew. Mildew is the most significant problem that we have here in the vineyard. Because there is grass, it means there will also be insects. If you have many different types of insects, they all control each other. The spider cannot prevail, for example. Well, that's a bit the base, the balance on the ground in the environment. You work in organic, right? Tell me about your approach to viticulture. When it comes to ecological viticulture, we can talk about several things. First, the treatments that only we use minerals for. For fungi, copper and sulfur. And then we also use plants to avoid so many treatments. Plants that can promote flowering or that can fortify the plant. or that it can also go against certain diseases if they are plants and prepared mixtures that are made with fermentations, etc. And then another very important thing about the ecological issue in our case, it is the management of the grass. If you see that here, for example, we have a vegetation cover. The vineyards that we have in many cases are old bunch vines that do not allow a tractor to pass, so we employed strategies which are a little different from those of other wineries. We use the tractor when we can, but in this case, for example, in this vineyard, 
where we can't fit that tractor. We work the vineyard with a horse, with a person dedicated to that. There are more wineries that do that kind of work because it is the best and the easiest way. Although it seems that we are going back to handle soil like this. And in the last two years we have changed the strategy, for example, in this vineyard. And what we do is, during the winter, the shepherd of the area comes and leaves us always the grass a little controlled, let's say. And then, already in spring, again he comes here with the sheep. It comes out of the growing season because, when the vine sprouts, sheep don't like the grass as much as the vine. That's why he can only come out in the growing season, but that somehow controls the cover crop quite a bit, the wild growth, and it also provides natural nutrients to the vine from the excrements. An Ebro Valley native, Garnacha is a well-loved grape. It is resistant to pests and was planted in great quantities after the phylloxera epidemic in Europe in the 1900s. However, it has gone from composing 90% of the total production at its peak in the 70s and 80s to 20% today. It was mainly used in the famous Navarro Rosés as well as young red wines, but is now retaking the winemaking scene in red wines of high sophistication and aging potential. Tempranillo is regarded as the great ambassador of Spanish wines and is no exception in Navarra as it plays a major part in the wine industry, making up to over 30% of their plantings nowadays. Together with Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, accounting for 16 and 14% of the total production respectively, gives rise to prestigious wines in the more international styles. Other grapes are also authorized in the deal, including Carignan, Syrah, Pinot Noir among the reds, and Chardonnay, Garnacha Blanca, Malvasia, Muscat, Appetit Grains, Bura and Sauvignon Blanc among the whites. And then that Garnacha that has been disappearing, because now there are more plantings of Tempranillo, for example, and even Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, that Garnacha that has been disappearing, the few of those that survive, that you are recovering, are the old ones, those who are many years old. That is correct. It should be noted that a vineyard is not good because it is old. That is, you always have to work, see the fruit, check and see the results, right? But it is true that after a certain age, the Garnacha reduces its yield a bit, its production. Garnacha is a variety that is very complicated because some years can give you a lot or other years can give you fewer grapes. When you work in ecology, when organic matter falls on the ground, rainwater, it's not only used by the vine, but also by the rest of the plants growing around. Herbs consume it, making it reduce the unit yield per vine, per kilo, leading to more concentrated berries, ones that are more aromatic, more terroir. It helps to reflect the terroir. In this case, it is a white garnacha, and here we make a white garnacha monoverato that ages in barrels for five years. The most characteristic of the winery are the vineyards that we have recovered. We are going to say that we have prevented them from disappearing, as so many other wineries have done. These are garnacha vineyards, who are a little more in the slopes of the Montejurra, which is nearby. We are talking about 50, 60, 70 year old vineyards from the 80s or 90s, the youngest from the 2000s. Also in Navarra, Merlot and Cabernet have entered with great force. And well, the Tempranillo has always been here, but there is now a lot of mixing between the three. In our case, the winery owners started to purchase many interesting vineyards in the area. So we have all kinds of varieties. We also have Merlot Cabernet. Anyway, the most interesting varieties, or that we particularly like, the most are typical of the area, such as Graciano, for example. It is a variety that is very interesting, and of course the Garnacha. And then the truth is that we have a Cabernet vineyard that we like a lot. We do not know why it produces such good grapes and so good wine, because it is not the most beautiful vineyard, but we like it a lot. Tomás, we are in front of a Cabernet Sauvignon vine. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, that you work a lot. Basically, 
that you specialize in these international varieties. They were introduced in Navarra about 30 or 40 years ago, and now they have spread and occupied quite a lot of plantations. Yes, here in Navarra, these are varieties that have worked well. They have adapted very well. But you have to work them differently than if we were in Bordeaux, for example, because we have way less rainfall and a different climate. What we tried is to maintain enough vegetation in front of the clusters. We try to mature until we reach a certain sugar concentration, because otherwise they would be somewhat green, and we train them for a low production yield. This vineyard, in a normal year, provides 4,500 kilos per hectare, or something like that. We practice an aggressive debudding. Well, you can see that we only leave two buds per branch, two or three maximum. What feature would you say that it makes it differ from the French Cabernet, from Bordeaux, for example? Well, I think they are more concentrated. They have more color, more power, a mouthfeel with more body. Perhaps more like Californian Cabernet? It could be. And this is your Merlot? Merlot, to me, is a variety that I've always liked, personally. I really like how it is. Well, it's a bit like the Cabernet profile. These are varieties that have a certain green character, so you need to know how to work them in low productions. From this Merlot, we make two types of wine a more traditional red that would be our reserve. And then we also make a sweet wine some years that we leave to over ripen and we do a small production of sweet wine. Well, the Syrah in this area, if with the Cabernet we talked about covering the clusters a little with the vegetation so that it does not receive the sunlight too directly, with the Syrah it is even more necessary I like to cover it up a little more. And well, this Syrah was the first one that was planted in the Nevada denomination of origin. This is harvested by hand in boxes. We have selection tables in the cellar, and from here we make two monovarietal wines. We make a young Syrah called Ya, and we make a Criantha Syrah called SH. I am in Tudela, in the subzone Rivera Baja of the denomination of origin Navarra. As mentioned before, Navarra has been a region of rosé wine production, mainly coming from Garnacha, which used to account for most of the plantings in the region. But this has changed in the last decades with local winemakers looking for the production of modern wines of high quality. Many winemakers are placing a strong effort into the elaboration of elegant red wines based on Garnacha, in many cases recovering old vineyards that are operated under strict sustainable principles. Aside of Garnacha, Navarra perhaps, together with the Penedes region, is now responsible for wines of distinction based on blends of the Tempranillo grape with well-known international varieties, such as Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot. These are blends that can only be found here, with Tempranillo adding complexity and a unique character to a wine style that is starting to be recognized internationally. Also, in smaller quantities, excellent white wines made in a modern style are also found here. These are mainly based on Bura and Garnacha Blanca. Well, Luis, uh, we are in your crianza room. Behind the camera, we can see your fermentation deposits. Here is where you have the El Yesal, in one of these barriques of 500 liters. Tell me about your elaboration process. I know that you have many styles and variations, but more or less in general. Okay, well, we are in Cito Menor, very close to downtown Pamplona. We have already left the Val Tharbe area. That is to say that the wines that I make here do not belong to the DO, although they are made with grapes from the DO Navarra. 
It is the same philosophy that in the field, which is what we try to do, we work manually without mechanical means. Minimal intervention in the cellar. It is exactly the same. That is, we work with indigenous yeast and bacteria when they do the malolactic conversion, with many years that the wines do not experience this malolactic conversion. Sometimes, the garnacha with 14.5% alcohol with a pH of 3.3 becomes a medium hostile to the malolactic bacteria, and we sometimes don't get it done. That ends up reinforcing a little the profile of the wine, and so it's not a problem. Here, we work by gravity. I've already shown you where we put the grapes, and we add 10 to 20% whole clusters to the deposits. Whole grapes that we tread a little, looking for a semi-carbonic maceration, a gentle profile of fruit, and the texture and depth that's given by the stems. In some cases, we have reached 50% of whole clusters, depending on the harvest. Rather short fermentations, depending, but around 14 or 16 days. Well, there's no written rule. Well, we try to refrigerate a little, not too much, but we try not to extract too many things because we don't clarify or filter the wine. To not filter or clarify, you have to extract little. If you get a lot of color, a lot of tannin, a lot of things that you are going to have to do aren't true to nature. Normally, the aging in barrels takes usually 10 to 12 months, always barrels of 500 liters. The Garnacha is a variety that in principle is elegant, with fine tannins. That is, we cannot give new wood in excess. You have to measure the amounts of wood accurately. And yes, it is true that we work with jars. In many cases, we make a wine 100% from a jar. In some cases, we only use them partially. We also work with Overflex tanks, which is a polypropylene material that greatly helps us develop the flavor in the mouth and preserves the fruit very well. We work with 54-litre Demijohns. The Demijohn is like a time capsule. It is a very reductive Creantha system where we preserve the fruit and the freshness of the wine perfectly. In the end, it is important for me to find different Creantha pathways and assemble everything. Carlos, we are in your production room that is very pretty and also pretty unique because some of these are not easy to see. You have wooden footrests behind you, big concrete tanks as the base for the elaboration of your wines. Can you explain it? Yes. Let's see. We base our elaboration in wood and concrete. They are more expensive deposits, more difficult to clean, more work. But in the end, the common characteristic is their porosity that avoids reductions of it. And when it comes to fermentations, the temperature stays pretty constant in these deposits. That is, here you see that we do not have the typical cooling shirt that you have to put in stainless steel tanks to keep them cold. We have other mechanisms to be able to cool it down, like using a cold plate. But the idea is that with these materials, generally many times it is almost not necessary. As the winter comes and the temperature doesn't rise much, it is regulated naturally. It also reduces the power consumption. So the main feature is that it allows micro oxygenation during fermentation. During fermentation, it is perhaps not so important, but then, although this is a processing room, the wine also spends time here resting. For example, when we do the coupage afterwards, we move it to the room of barriques. Here the wine can be two, three or four months waiting to be bottled at the times that suits us best. And in the end, it also spends some time resting itself here. While in here, the micro-oxygenation occurs. Our philosophy is to do wines that express our terroir. And we consider that the yeast is part of the terroir in some way. And that is our way of thinking. We respect very much what others do, but we look for wines with a personality different from the rest. So we use yeast. They are not the same as the others. Carlos, now we are in your Crianza room, where you mature your wines, which you do in wood foodress or barrels. That's correct. All our wines age at least a year in this room, which is the aging room. And we work with different barrel sizes and fordras. In this case, this is a 4,000 litre fordra for example, 
and depending on what we are looking for in each wine. We want a wine that has evolved, that is not a young wine, that it has more nuances and that extends life a little more. But we don't want wood to have much prominence. We are going to slightly larger sizes. For example, we make out Emilio Valerio wine in this way. Here you have a mixture of different grapes. Yes, here our Emilio Valerio is a mixture of any varieties, as I told you before. We have various fordras and we mix them all. Here you have Garnacha, Tempranillo, Merlot. And sometimes we also ferment different grapes together for the Emilio Valerio. In other wines we do monovarietal, even single plot wines. But in Emilio Valerio we are realizing that it is interesting even mixing varieties at the time of fermentation. It also depends on the varieties. For example, for Garnachas we don't like 225 liter barrels, so we use them of 500 liters and in the future of a thousand. And yet with the Cabernet or Graciano, which are varieties much more powerful, we use smaller barrels. We play a little according to what we are looking for, taking into account the variety. I see, those mortality gifts help from the wood to sustain. Gonzalo, we are inside the cooperative that produces 3 million liters of wine. But these are your amphoras, where you make your most personal wine. How is the process of elaboration? In these amphoras, we make one of the whites, which is Huracan Daniela. What we do, it's a fermentation with moderately controlled temperature, but not too low, so that there is enough expression and enough mouthfeel from the fermentation in the amphora. And then we keep it for almost six months with all its leaves. We do not remove the gross leaves, and all the leaves stay inside the amphora, keeping them in suspension. Once a week we move it with the idea of keeping the wine cloudy, Then we eventually stop and let the wine to decant. And then a gentle filtration into the bottle. We also make in amphora some rosé wines. We do the white and some rosés that undergo a fairly long criantha in barrels. Let's say the amphora, what it does is mature, gradually assembling the aromas. Gonzalo, we are now in the room where you have the fermentation barrels. This is where you ferment the rosés. That's correct. These are harvested manually. We obtain the must by bleeding. It's mandatory in the denomination of origin. No external pressure can be exerted, and that same must directly passes to the barrel, even without clarifying, because already with the bleeding, we get it to come out very clean, and we are not interested in cleaning the must much either. We like that it has a certain character, because we look for a lot of mouth, goes directly to the deposit, which is where we do the fermentation, and in the case of Huella Daitana Cuvée, which is the premium version, it comes to these barriques of 500 liters, where it does the fermentation and rests for almost eight months with its leaves. Resting for eight months in barriques is enough to be noted in the wine, and then we pass it to an amphora, where it stays for 10 months, where all the flavors from the fruit and the wood get assembled. Gonzalo, now we are in the elaboration room of Bodega Sunsi, which is a project to recover all vineyard plots. And we are in the area where you made the wines in these wood deposits. Tell me about the elaboration process. Yes, the project was born about 10 years ago, recovering vineyards that were abandoned in very high areas. We recovered vines from 600 meters of altitude, exclusively from San Martín de Unx and only Garnacha. We were looking for something very authentic. The idea, indeed, the slogan of the winery, is the landscape in a bottle of wine, to transmit the place of origin. We have two entry wines, that we call them terraces, that ferment in barrique and undergo crianza in contact with the leaves in wood both in Fordra and barrel of 600 liters for four to six months, depending on the year. 
And then there is the rest terrazas that ferments in stainless steel, although at times we have made them also in wood, and is aged between 5 and 6 months in these wood deposits, and in barriques of 300 and 500 litres. We always work with large barrel sizes, because we have made a lot of effort in what is the location of the vineyard. We look for a lot of character, especially from the terroir, of the area or origin, of the vegetation, of the environment, which is why we look for large wood deposits to avoid too much wood. The wine would go in these practically clean, as we do not age with less in the red, only in the white. And then we make a sweet wine that we also want to recover with garnacha, as the elaboration of traditional rancios from Navarra. We have mixed the elaboration of a rancio wine and what could be a crianza wine. This is like the soleras in sherry. It is aged in glass demijohns, left under the sun for a minimum of one year, which is how rancio was made, and later it passes to a system of crianza and soleras, where it remains another two more years. There it gets a mix of vintages, and then it goes on the market. We are in your crianza room. This is where your wines for aging come. Some wines you make young, but for those who undergo crianza in wood, Syrah, Cabernet and Merlot, what kind of crianza do you do? Do you work differently, different varieties? Yes, as you said, out of all the red wines we have, there is only one that does not see the barrel, one for the Syrah. The rest all pass by aging in barrels. And well, we like to work with very different woods too, in different volumes. For example, this is 300 litres, this is 400 litres of capacity. We have some of 500 as well. Depending on the variety, we go to larger or smaller volumes. For example, the Cabernet and the Merlot, I like to work them in standard barriques, 225 or at most 300 litres. On the other hand, in the Syrah, I go for larger, 300 and 400 litres. They can also change the toasting levels. For Merlot, I like low toasting levels and longer crianthas. Well, what I think I have commented before in the vineyard, they age between 15 and 24 months. And instead, the Syrah can age between 10 and 13 months, depending on the vintage because we always make our wines from our own vineyard and always from the same one. My Cabernet is always my one Cabernet. So seeing how the year is, well, I put it in a barrel of one kind or another, the vintage marks us a lot in the wineries of our style. After passing through the barrel, do they rest in the bottle before hitting the market? Especially Cabernet and Merlot? Yes, they rest for quite a long time in the bottle. Also the Merlot. Now I am with the 2017 vintage, but I'm going to start soon with the 2018, and that has spent 18 months in the bottle right now. And for the Cabernet, I also like it too. What I'm starting to sell now is a 2018, it has been 12 months in the bottle. On the other hand, that is not so crucial for the Syrah. I am in Murchante, in the lower end of the Navarra Dio, in the Ribera Baja subzone. We have learned about the viticultural practices and winemaking styles in Navarra. The natural question is how all this translates into the palate. I believe it is time to taste the wines, don't you think? I cannot wait more, particularly when I think that we will also be trying some of the best cuisine Navarra has to offer. Great Enrique, let's talk about Artaso. Artaso means home oak in Euskera. These are two vineyards, one in Artajona and the other from Artazo. This falls inside my project of recovering old vineyards, vineyards from Artajona and Artazo. I am looking for a superior wine. 
it's always the case that the vineyards that behave better have more acidity. Looking for a pH of 3.3. Looking for acidic fruit. Let me know what you think about this wine. I always think that this is the best wine that I have ever made. Well, let's see, it has an interesting nose. It is a good wine. It also has a herbal touch, but it's a little different. We have more raspberry. It has tension. A little more profile, fruity, more strawberry, red fruit, acidic fruits, okay? Tension, the wine stays on you. Also texture. It is authentic and it's not clarified, without filtration. It is a super original wine with a very evident expression of what the Garnacha is in these areas. From a little further north in Navarra, Altazu and Artajona, it picks up the mint, the terroir, the leaves, herbs, thyme, rosemary. With Garnacha, that aromatic complexity has to accompany us. We feel the very unique landscape that we have here. Here now, we have El Yasal in the glass. See si, Enrique, this is our Grand Cru. As I told you, that calcareous soil. And well, here normally we always have a little less colour, okay? Less intensity. I would say this goes to the lower end of the intensity in colour of this grape. It is very mineral. We also have cherry, a more elegant red fruit. The raspberry is more prominent. Very elegant red fruit, but always with a slightly more vegetal aspect. With the wine in your mouth for a few seconds, and it goes up. The limestone remains, the texture of the wine. We clearly see the terroir in an evident way. We also have a bit of texture, fruit, elegance, finesse. An authentic wine, with character, with elegance, gentle. Very good, Luis. Well, this is a fantastic wine, like all the others. Thank you very much for receiving us, showing us the vineyard so beautiful and explaining how you make your wines. Thank you. You know where we are. This is the best moment after so much talk to try the wines. Let's start with your Emilio Valerio. Yes, this is the wine that we produce the most, that we sell the most, and that it is the flagship of our winery, so to speak. It is a mixture representing the diversity which we have in our vineyards. We have five variables in this case, which are Carnacha, Tempranillo, Graciano, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. One year in Fordra. Let's try it. It has an intense color. Yes, they're generally pretty concentrated. It is a dry terrain too. That makes for quite a bit of skin proportion. You tell by the color. I would say that it's complex because it has a bit of everything. The touch of the house are the balsamic notes. Those herbaceous notes and then the gentle wood, which results from time in the fordra. The wood is not very, very present, but it softens the wine, conferring a little touch of leather. And then is a very well-structured wine. I think that it also stands out, like in all our wines, is a substantial acidity, coming from the fact that these are vineyards work dry without irrigation. That results in concentration of everything, including the acids. We never correct or add acid to our wines, but they are pretty acid naturally. Carlos, this is the wine from the vineyard where we discuss about viticulture, right? Yes, but a few years later. Now we have those grapes in the bottle. This is a 2015 vintage. This is a Garnacha Blanca with five years in barriques of 500 litres. We do betonage a few months and then we let it sit to mature in the barrel. This is a very nice golden colour. Almost orange, right? 
I love this kind of wine. I can feel the leaves, the pasticerie. Lots of dry fruit. And it has a gentle oxidative touch, not like a sherry, but along those lines. Then in the mouth it always surprises me the delicacy. It has a long finish as well. I like it a lot, and it lasts forever. It has a long finish, fantastic. Well, Carlos, thanks a lot for all your explanations, for showing us your vineyards and this beautiful winery that you have here. Thank you for visiting us. <laughs>
Yes, we always tilt the grills down because that way the fat that the chop releases falls here into this container. This way we avoid creating a flame that would not allow us to cook it so well. The steak will be burned, you know. And what do you do now? I put salt. How much? I used a lot of salt. The steak takes what it needs. Right, so we're waiting for the chuleton, the bistec, the big bistec. And in the meantime, they're gonna bring us some very characteristic dishes of the area. And this is tortilla de bacalao, that is called omelette. Uh, very typical from here, I never try it. <laughs> but it's so good, because I love cod. So omelette of cod cannot be bad. So it is ready to take it out. Are you going to cut it? Yes, right now it's done. And we're going to cut it in pieces to serve it. Oh wow, it's very tender. How does it look? To me, personally, I like that it remains uncooked inside. So here we are. This is the chuleton, recently made. I'm gonna take a little bit of it. Look at this, my goodness. And accompany it with the uh, pimentos de cristal, so it's that glass peppers, and pimentos de piquillo, that is kind of piquillo pepper, has no translation. Let me try this and see how does it taste. Excellent. <laughs> Well, Gonzalo, the most fun part is tasting the wines. Here we have one of your most premium rosé wines, which is a Garnasa that you have explained its elaboration to us before. Tell us about it. Yes, actually, the Huella de Aitana is our best rosé. I mean, it's the sweet darling of my wine collection. And this is me, who is very much in love with rosé wines from this area. We try to break a little that stereotype that they should be fresh. This is a wine that we call a rosé for aging. We have lost the intense fruit with so much time of crianza, but we are gaining some very marked mineral notes and very present brioche notes as well. Notes that, despite being a rosé, makes the wine to withstand a steak, a home stew or any strong dish because the flavor is very intense. And then it has a huge mouthfeel. A very nice color, salmon. Yes, almost like copper. The color denotes development. And in the nose, it is very citric. There is a lot of tangerine, a lot of orange. Now that they are fruits that seem like they should not come out in red varieties, although it is true that it has a little bit of garnacha blanca as well. Actually, it contains 15% garnacha blanca. The rest is red garnacha above all. I see two brioche and pastry notes, and then very mineral comes in sweet, the wood immediately noticeable in the mouth. It is very explosive, it has sweetness, but it is very sharp at the same time. Very vertical, with a lot of acidity, volume and flavor. They are wines made with that idea that they can age. In this case, it is a 2019, but that it can be five more years in the bottle. You can continue drinking it and enjoy making pairings of contrast. Well, different things. Fantastic wine. Huracan Daniela. This is a white made in the amphora that we have seen before. A white garnacha base and a little bit of chardonnay. It is very pale in color. Yes, it's the white garnacha. In general, it is usually quite straw colored, even though it has been in amphora. The leaves make the color to evolve a lot and above all, what we are looking for is a wine with a very gastronomic profile, not exuberant on the nose but with a wide aromatic range. A lot of fruit, a lot of herbal character, even spices. And with the six months that we leave it in contact with the leaves, we look for mouthfeel, amplitude, volume. 
Let's see, it is a wine, I would say, with a lot of registers, but none very exuberant. A very elegant, fine wine that works with many things, with many different dishes. This is Terrazas Blanco. It is a wine that ferments in barrique and then undergoes a crianza of four months in wood, as I have shown you before. On the label we try to reflect the background from the valleys, which is where we have the Garnacha Blanca, and then a personalized bottle that also tries to summarize what has been the selection process of the project. We are looking for a mountain area that comes represented here three-dimensional. Then we made a selection of the different terraces, different vineyards and profile each soil. It summarizes a bit what the project is about. Very original. Here we also look for a wine, above all gastronomic, although they are wines that work with everything. In color it's also quite straw, as is usually the white garnacha. It is not very intense on the nose, but it has many things. There is some white fruit, pastis notes and herbs. And on the palate it is very fresh and very long. It also has that bitter point of garnacha and the wood, and when you swallow it, despite being a white, it lasts a long time. It is long, perhaps not that much volume, but it has a long finish. Well, and lastly, we're going to try this sweet wine, which is something a bit special. It is also made with garnacha. Good for dessert, but I personally like it as an appetizer, because aside of the sweetness level, it is also a wine with a very good acidity, because the garnacha is precisely, which is very acidic in these areas of high elevation. It is not a heavy wine, but a wine that asks for a second glass. You get all those raisins appear, a bit of dried fruit. How do you elaborate it? By letting the grapes dry in the vineyards. Not much. Basically, we should talk about overmaturation rather than letting the grapes dry. We let them ripen to achieve 16 to 17 percent potential alcohol level. Then it is harvested and the must extracted by bleeding. And then it is placed in the barrique where it ferments. When it reaches 5% ABV, then it is fortified with spirit. The fermentation is halted, increasing the alcohol level to 15 or 15.5%. Then it stays for a year in the barrique. After that, it goes out for a year in demijohns of blue glass, and then to the criantha and solera system. Open demijohns? No, they are closed with cork, but enough air inside to achieve oxidation. This is a whole process of oxidation and concentration with the criantha in the solera system. Like if it was a cereal wine, how long does it stay there? Another three years. Above all, despite being a sweet wine, with some over-ripening and with fortification, it is not too heavy in the mouth. It is still a fresh wine. It is very good. Gonzalo, thanks for teaching us about cooperatives, the vineyards, the terraces, and your two wineries. So delighted. Good luck in the future. Thank you. Well, let's try the wines. We'll start with your Cabernet. Very well, yes. This is a Cabernet from 2018. It has been in Barrique for 12 months. It has a very nice color, very intense. This is how I like the Cabernets and the Merlots. They over-ripen and get an old red color. In the nose, it is a wine that you have to leave open for a while to let it breathe. It needs to breathe and get some air. It has been 12 to 14 months in the bottle. You can feel fruit jam, ripened fruits. You can also get some herbaceous notes, and always with notes of wild forest. I like to make wines that are pleasant on the palate, 
Really, I don't like it if they are very coarse. It has a body, but it is a very mature wine. And in the mouth, those aromas that we said of candied fruit come out again. Very good. And now the Merlot. Yes, the Merlot from the vineyard that we have been to before, which is our wine with the longest Criantha, with the longest pass by Barrique. This one also comes to me with quite ripe fruit, more like plum. Yes, even prune, marmalade. Something very characteristic of our wines and from the vineyard is that they have a lot of acidity. So although they are warm wines because they are very ripe, the acidity counteracts that warmth and makes the wines not heavy. We're going to end it with the Syrah, with this one that is your reserve Syrah. That's correct. This Syrah has seen Criantha. It has been aged in wood. This is a Syrah that I like, that has a lot of fruit, that displays an explosion of fruit and a gentle touch of barrel just to give it a bit of complexity. It has been aged in larger barrels than the Cabernet and Merlot. Well, let's go. Let's try. This is a younger wine from a recent vintage and the Syrah has that more bluish hue. This is an intense color, very intense. Oh, this is a wine with the spices. On the nose, it gives spices, fresh fruit, and flowers as well. And in the mouth, well, I don't know if I've mentioned it already, but we like to do wines that are elegant in the mouth. Because for me, the nose or the aroma and the color are interesting, but to me what matters is the mouth. We like to make fine wines that can have more or less body, but that they are elegant in the mouth. And this wine, for example, is very long on the palate because the taste lasts a long time. It is very, very long, but it's delicate. This can be paired with everything. That's what I was going to tell you. It can pair with everything. It does not matter, an aperitif, or a fish, meat, or sweet, with chocolate, for example. This is very elegant, too. Very good, very good. Well, Tomas, thank you very much for having us. With you, we finished our visit to Navarra. We have crossed it from the north to the south, passing by the five sub-zones of the denomination. Nice. And learning about the most traditional approaches with centenary garnacha, to the most international initiatives like your wines. It's been a fantastic journey. And then the food is awesome. Not bad, driving through the region, visiting different producers. Very interesting. Thanks a lot for coming. It has been an extraordinary journey through a region little known outside of Spain, aside of the bull riding in San Fermin, but that it offers an incredible diversity of products. The locals have opened their homes and their herds to show us their way of living and understanding nature. We will always be grateful to this region and its people. I promise to have a Navarra wine in my cellar at all times. My friends must know about them. Cheers.